Howdy, and welcome to the Feed Bandit Podcast, where we talk all things hunting and introduce you to the most innovative hunting gear and services. Here are your hosts, Jimmy Byrne and Richard Kinchlow. Howdy, folks. Welcome back to the Feed Bandit Podcast. Jimmy here, coming at you with another edition of our series, Campfire Stories. I'll be reading another one from the book, The Greatest Hunting Stories Ever Told and providing a little commentary as we go through that and uh we hope you like it this one is called last shell in the rifle by ben east i have never heard it said better than by captain peter funchen the renowned danish adventurer and explorer who married an eskimo girl and lived many years in arctic greenland no more beautiful animal walks on four feet he told me once when we were talking about the polar bear I say I don't know much about polar bears, so this one, bears, so this one should be pretty interesting. I hope you guys find it interesting too. No matter how long I live, I'm sure I shall never forget the first one I saw outside a zoo. He was standing on a rocky headland at the top of a cliff that rose vertically from a boulder littered beach, staring out over a gray and empty reach of sea. A gale was sweeping down from the northwest. Savage surf was smoking along the beach and the sky was black with the clouds of a violent rain squall. Save for the handful of us aboard the schooner, the bear could well have been the only living thing in that wild, storm-swept world. He was a magnificent animal, as I shall ever lay lay eyes on. His white pelt was faintly tinged with yellow, and standing motionless at the top of the cliff, he could have been a bear carved out of old ivory. Yet there was him about something wonderfully alive, too, something that proclaimed his rightful place in that desolate, lonely escape. It was the summer of 1937. An Ontario man who had hopes of setting himself up in the guiding and outfitting business, taking clients into remote and rarely visited places in the far north, had organized a trip that summer along the east shore of James Bay and into the lower end of Hudson Bay. He chartered the venture a weather-beaten 43-foot schooner, auxiliary-powered with an old diesel engine, owned and skippered by Jack Palmquist, then the only free trader competing with the Hudson's Bay Company on James Bay. Palmquist's crew consisted of a Cree deckhand and a good-humored Eskimo who tended the ancient diesel as a mother tends a child. Neither spoke English, but the skipper married, but the skipper, excuse me, married to a pretty mission-educated Cree girl was fluent in her language. The Eskimo also spoke Cree, so there was always a way around the language barrier. At the trading post and summer camp of the Crees at East Main, Palmquist also took aboard a leather-faced Indian pilot to see us through the bleak island shelter channels along the coast we would travel. No charts of those waters existed then, and only a Cree who knew them from a lifetime of canoe travel and remembered each island, each headland, Each clump of stunted spruce trees could follow the maze of channels and avoid the reefs. The outfitter had hired three guides and a cook, and there were nine clients in the party. I was one of them. We were the first sportsmen to penetrate that wild and roadless country. It was a region that only an occasional roving prospector, the Mounties, missionaries, and the men of the HBC had ever seen. Apart from then, it belonged to the Crees and a handful of coastal Eskimos. Incidentally, the outfitter's plans fell through after one summer, so for many years we were the last as well as the first party of guided sportsmen to travel that coast. I have roamed the backcountry of this continent for 50 years, from the Great Smokies and the Diamondback-infested flatwoods of Florida to Maine, from the Texas desert to the Aleutian Islands of Alaska, but that treeless and lonely country that I, can, that I call the land of midnight twilight was the most fascinating place I have ever seen. The land was untouched, the people primitive, living by the trap line and fishnet, the fishnet and the gun. We saw steel traps set on low driftwood posts to catch owls for the cooking pots of the Crees. We heard loons called to the gun and shot for the same purpose. At the trading posts, we saw summer camps of as many as 500 nomad Cree trappers living in roomy wing as they had before the whites came. 
We fished the virgin pools of whitewater streams where the three-pound speckled trout rose to flies, spinners, or even small strips torn from a red bandana. It was an easy matter for two or three rods to take in a couple hours of all the trout the party could eat at, at three meals. We had no way to keep fresh meat aboard the venture. So we lived for many days on a diet of trout and learned to our surprise that it palled rather quickly. For ten, ten days, we camped beyond the side of trees, carrying our tent poles along and re relying on driftwood for our cooking fares, fires. We tramped mossy barrens where tar tarmogen were far more plentiful than rough, uh, rough grouse, grouse back home. When autumn came, those treeless barrens would also be alive with geese, beginning their fall flight from summer home still farther in the north. Seals followed our schooner, and at night, white whales blew close enough to awaken us. The half-wild sled dogs on, of half a dozen Indian and Eskimo camps howled, howled us to sleep time and again. Every minute of the trip was pure adventure. There was no hunting. The Quebec gov government was keeping the wildlife, from waterfowl to seals to polar and polar bears, and trust for the Crees and the Eskimos, who needed it. But Howard Cooper, a hunting partner of mine from Kalamazoo, Michigan, and I carried collecting permits obtained by two museums uh, back home, authorizing us to take for scientific purposes any birds or animals we chose. Well, that's a good idea. That's <laughs> Man, this uh, wilderness sounds quite amazing. It's it's a it is a far cry from where we hunt down at Rancho Bandito, but uh yeah, pretty cool. Toward the end of July, the venture dropped anchor off Long Island. Not the Long Island you've heard about all your life. This one's a rocky sliver of land, 3 or 4 miles offshore near the southern end of Hudson Bay. We had come now to polar bear country. We left most of the party camped on the island, and Palmquist and his crew took Cooper and myself on a bear hunt. It was a strange place to look for polar bears. We headed for a small group of treeless islands, not shown on any map we had, lying 30 or 40 miles off the coast. We were farther south than the latitude of Juneau, Alaska, yet the HBC post man managers, the Crees and our skipper, had all assured us that we would find bears summering on those islands. At the Fort George post, a Cree had even shown us the pelts of three, a female and two cubs, that he had killed only that spring on an adjoining mainland. We found the island we were looking for, but it had no shelter for a boat and raging seas, driven by a gale screaming down from the ice fields 500 miles to the north, kept us from going ashore. We found a sheltered harbor on a smaller island half a mile away and landed without difficulty. It was from there that I saw my first polar bear looking out to sea from his rocky headland. We watched him for hours through binoculars and spotting scope. In late afternoon, the storm subsided and we got a freight canoe ashore on the beach below the cliffs. Cooper and I, and Tommy Laneboy, our old Cree pilot, landed in the canoe. Laneboy had no rifle. Cooper and I were each carrying Model 99 Savages and 300 caliber. At the time, I thought them adequate. I would not think so today. The island was about two miles long and half as wide rising in vertical cliffs at one end, sloping down to submerged reefs at the other. The top was a rolling expanse of low hills and ravines, all rock and moss, with no vegetation taller than clumps of arctic willow that did not reach to a man's knee. But there were plenty of places for a bear to hide, and ours had disappeared. He had watched our boat as it neared the island and taken to his heels. We separated. Cooper and Lame Boy headed for the far side of the island. I set out to search the broken sea cliffs. The job was on the hairy side, for there were places where I could round a big rock and meet the bear only three or four steps away. I was moving slowly and carefully when I heard a shot rap out from the direction Cooper had taken, followed almost at once by another. I scrambled to the top of the cliff for a look. Man, that's just like sitting out in a deer blind, you know, out there with some buddies, and you're spread out, and all of a sudden you, you hear a shot, and we're on the on our phones texting each other immediately. Hey, who's that? You get one? Uh, no. <laughs> I can't imagine kind of being out there like this guy was. I made out the small figure of my hunting partner, three quarters of a mile away, but I could see nothing of the bear. While I watched, Howard fired a third shot, and to my astonishment, I heard the 180-grain soft point go whining angrily over my head as a ricochet. If Cooper was firing towards me, the bear must be somewhere between us. And then I saw him, half a mile away, out of range for Howard, running towards me like a big white dog that I had called. 
I learned later that Cooper had not really had him in range at, at any time, but had shot in the hope of sending him back my way. He succeeded better than he expected. I learned something else later. The bear did not know I was there. The face of the cliff behind me was broken by a ravine that ran all the way down to the beach, and there was a well-used bear trail in the bottom of it. That was, in all likelihood, his customary path to the sea, and he was coming to use it. I was aware of mixed feelings. I wanted him to keep coming, for from the time I planned the trip, I had wanted more than anything else to take a polar bear. But at the same time, although I had used a rifle for years, starting with a twenty two as a boy, I was no crack shot, and this bear was the first game I had ever confronted bigger than a white-tailed deer. Could I deal with him? Well, I'd soon f find out. I went down on one knee to escape his attention, and watched him come. He dropped out of sight in a shallow dip, but when he came up on my side, uh, um, we came up on my side of it, he was still on course, traveling at a lumbering, ground-eating run. I tried my first two shots while he was still too far away for accurate shooting with iron sights. They were clean misses, and he paid them no attention. The next one scored. He braked to a stop, swinging his head from side to side like a big white snake caught by the tail, biting savagely at the top of both shoulders. When it was all over, I learned that my 180 gram soft point had hit him in the back just behind the neck, too high to do any real damage, and had gone through under the heavy layer of fat that padded him, just deep enough to cut muscle and draw blood. I, su I suppose it must have burned like a branding iron. But from his actions... I was sure he would go down in a second or two, and in my lack of experience with dangerous game, I made a bad blunder. I scrambled to my feet, ready to move closer, and put in a finishing shot. I never got the chance. The instant I stood up, he saw me for the first time. He swerved and came for me in a deadly, business-like charge, head down, running as, as a cross dog runs to bark at a passing car. I shot too fast and threw away one more chance to stop him, and as he closed the distance between us to less than 30 yards, I felt cold fear of a kind I've never known before or since. I had started with one shell in the chamber of the savage and four in the magazine. I had used four. That meant only one was left. There would be no time for reloading, and all my confidence that I could kill the bear had evaporated. Hey, hold on one quick moment. Hey folks, have you ever wished that there was an easier way to find the hunting feed, supplies, and services you need, when and where you need them? If so, check out our hunter search at feedbandit.com, where you can see what hunting suppliers are in your area or are on the way to your land. Don't waste any more precious time searching Google or calling around for feed, blinds, feeders, or even outfitters. Just use our targeted search for hunters, the Feed Bandit Hunter Search, over at feedbandit.com. We'll find your feed. Afterward, I could not remember firing the fish shot, but my subconscious, if it took over, did a far better job than I had been doing. I heard the whiplash report of the 300, and the bear collapsed as if lightning had struck him. His head dropped between his front legs. He fell and skidded to a stop, rolled almost in a ball. Not so much as a shudder of movement stirred him anywhere. I sidled away when, then while I fed five fresh holes frantically into the rifle. When that was done, I began to feel ready for more trouble if it came. I stood and watched for three or four minutes, waiting for some sign of life in the bear. Then I saw Tommy Laneboy coming across the island at a run, only a hundred yards away. Although unarmed, the old Cree was not running to me. He was running to the bear. I could not let him arrive until I was sure it was dead. I walked in with, with the safety off and prodded the big ball of white fur in the neck and ribs. There was no answering quiver, and I stepped back and waited for Tommy. Together we rolled the bear over enough to pull his head out from beneath his body. The round hole of my last bullet was trickling blo blood just above the nose, dead center between the eyes. It had mushroomed in the brain, and there was hardly any piece of bone bigger than a silver dollar left intact in the skull from the jaw's back. Before we moved the bear, I went back and found the five empty cases I had ejected from the rifle. I wanted to know just how close he had been when I killed him. I stepped it off seventeen paces. 51 feet. I hardly wondered that I had been frightened or that for many nights afterwards I dreamed of his final rush. Dreamed he was standing over me ready to finish me off. It was a dream that brought me awake in a cold sweat each time. We hoisted the bear aboard the schooner and took him back to the camp on Long Island unskinned. There, 
Alicock, our pleasant little Eskimo engineer, offered to take the pelt off. Alicock knew no English and, of course, could not write, but I have never seen hands more deft with a knife. Three days later, on a somewhat bigger island, 30 or 40 miles to the south, Cooper made his bear hunt. The party found anchorage for the venture in a small harbor, and Howard went ashore with Palmquist, Lane Boy, and Roy McGuire, one of our guides. Almost at once, they found a line of big bear tracks leading, leading up across the sand of the beach, the footprint still wet with water that had dripped from the bear's legs. He had come in from the sea less than an hour before. Half a mile farther on, Cooper spotted a patch of white behind a tangle of driftwood just, bo- just above the beach. At first he took it for snow, but when Palmquist put a tw- question to Tommy Laneboy, the old Cree replied with a firm, Wahabesko, the name for polar bear in his language. The hunters were within a hundred yards of the bear when they heard it or winded them. The hunters were within a hundred yards of the bear when it heard or winded them and sat up on its haunches. Cooper told me afterward that it was so big it reminded him of a short-legged, burly white horse. He broke its back with his first shot, ran in close, and finished it cleanly with a second soft point in the neck. Unfortunately, at the time, neither Howard nor I was aware of the Boone and Crockett system of measuring and scoring trophies. As a result, the skull of that bear was never measured, but his body measurements, taken with a steel tape before he was skinned, revealed a polar bear of extraordinary size. He measured 18 inches between the ears. 52 around the neck just behind the head, and ten and a half feet from tip of nose to tip of tail. I still believed he would have stood very high on the Brun and Crockett record list. He was skinned the next morning, and the hunters came back to our camp at the mouth of a small river 50 miles south of Cape Jones. Two families of Crees sailed their canoes in behind the venture, and in return for a sweater, a few pounds of flour, tea, sugar, and some canned fruit, the woman agreed to flesh the pelt of the big bear. The scene that evening, light, lighted by the big driftwood fire behind our camp, is printed indelibly in my memory. Cooper had killed the second bear, to which his collecting permit entitled him, an immature animal that weighed around 300 pounds, and brought it back to the mainland on skin. The Cree women took the pelt off before they, before they went to work on the big one, and we gave them a big kettle of the meat. While they worked by firelight on the bear, bear pelts, their men got two wigwams up and baked bannock for supper. In the dim twilight of that subarctic midnight, a greased-rimmed ke- kettle of bear stew was bubbling on the fire, and the whole party of Crees was hunched in an eager, grinning circle around it. The last sound we heard in our sleeping bags that night was the wild and doleful howl- howling, howling excuse me, of a gaunt, ill-fed Indian sled dog, staked on a ba- babich leech behind it, one of the wigwams. His nose was full of the scent of the bear's short ribs, but such feasts, alas, were not for him, and he sang his hunger song long after silence had settled over the camp. The rest of the smaller bear Cooper gave to Tommy Laneboy, and when we reached the Fort George trading post where the old Cree was camped for the summer, we witnessed a strange and ancient Indian ritual. The bear carcass was ferried ashore in one of our freight canoes, and a group of Crees picked the big canoe up boldly with the bear in it, six or eight men on either side. They lifted it to their shoulders and carried it ceremoniously through the camp of some 500 Indians to Tommy's wigwam. There it was cut up and divided amongst many families, in keeping with Creek custom when a big animal was killed. One of the most surprising things about that long-ago bear hunt was the fact that it happened only a hundred miles farther, as a crow flies, from Salt St. Marie in my home state of Michigan, than the distance from that same city south to Detroit. The white bear of the north is not always an animal of the Arctic ice. Very interesting. That was an exciting little story. I don't know if uh, I don't know much about polar bear hunting. I mean, I assume it probably still exists out there. Uh, it'd be interesting to hear if anyone listening has ever been part of that or gone that far north to go bear hunting or whatnot. Uh, if anyone has a good story to tell, please let us know. Uh, go to feedbanitpodcast.com you can recount it on a voicemail or you shoot us an email quick email and let us know we'd love to see pictures too if you happen to get that or any kind of you know super large bear be very interesting to hear but uh, in the meantime we hope you enjoyed this little campfire story and we'll keep this series going it's always fun to uh, listen to a good hunting story and these are the stories that I, 
I think I'll enjoy reading or at least putting this series out there for uh, my children when they really get into hunting. They can start listening to them. So we hope you like them too. But with that, everyone out there, y'all take care. Thanks for listening to the Feed Bandit Podcast. If you like what we discuss on the show, be sure to sign up to our email list to get even more killer hunting ideas, tips, tricks, and exclusive deals on innovative hunting gear and services delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up over at FeedBandit.com or simply by texting the word BANDIT to 33777. See you on the next one. And remember, support your local feed store.